back and it's summer. It's really, really, really warm. And we turned off the air conditioning <laughs> because of sound and so this may be short depending on how <laughs> long it lasts. But um, introduce yourself. Who am I here with today? I'm Aiden. I'm the Knitting Monk. I'm coming to you from Holy Cross Monastery in the Hudson Valley in New York. And haven't you, haven't you had a new station since I was here? Did something happen? Oh, yeah, Tell yeah. Tell me what happened. Uh, I was ordained a priest about a month ago, actually. And so does that mean you can still be a monk? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. But Absolutely. have you, you're you still deciding on your life journey, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. have you decided yet? Um, I'm leaning towards being like professed and staying here. You are? Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. surprised by that. For some reason, I thought you were going the other direction. I may have been when you and I last okay. talked. Okay. <laughs> but I still have a year you do. before, actually like almost a year and a half before I have to make a decision. I, so, for some reason, I yeah. thought it was shorter also. I thought it was like a six, like six. Okay, so we, we might have yeah. to come back again. <laughs> do you have a party when you do that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We a big celebration. Yes. Yeah. But today we're here to talk about <laughs> book club, which is this is the book. It's okay. I think we probably say it the same way. It's called Creft. Creft. Yeah. Yes. Creft. Yeah. By Alexander Lingland. Now you have read this. You read this a while ago. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you've already done videos on this, but I purposely didn't watch them. Oh, good. So good. I. Thought, I didn't do an extensive. You didn't. No. 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 Okay. I just mentioned it. Talked about it a little bit. Okay. So. So I'm only about, let's see, I'm on page 147, and I just got kind of into the fiber section. Uh -huh. I don't think, yeah. I think there's only a couple sections about... Like, yeah, there's just one chapter on fiber. Yeah. yeah. So, please tell me what were your thoughts and impressions on the book? Well, I really loved it. Um, I thought that sort of my overall impression of it was that he did this beautiful job of tracking the relationship between craft and the landscape that kind of provides the context for the craft. Um, the parts that I found particularly engaging were really about the um, what he calls an illiteracy of power that is developing in kind of the modern digital era where oh. we're not just losing it's not that we're losing the ability to do crafts, we're losing the ability to figure out the puzzle of how to kind of meet our own needs um, because now we meet our needs by pressing a button whereas before like if you wanted to stay warm in the winter you had to know how to tend the sheep and shear the sheep and spin the wool and knit the sweater you know you had to like learn all of that and now you just go to the shop and buy one um, I mean not any of us because we knit Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All of our sweat, all mm -hmm. of our sweaters, mm -hmm. all of them. Know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what your your point is to get warmth, we just literally turn on the heat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very few people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are still some people who actually do. Uh, what is it called? Wood burning. Wood burning. Oh stoves. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's still a thing. Yeah, and they're so warm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But even yeah. then, they may not chop their own wood. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's everything true. has become mm -hmm. just sort of. At our mm -hmm. fingertips. Mm -hmm. So that was your main takeaway. Yeah, that was my main takeaway. Why did you one. choose to read it in the first place? Um, I chose to read it because, as you know, I'm really engaged in kind of the larger meaning of craft. And, um, I mean, I love making stuff and giving presents and, and handling the yarn and all of that kind of thing. But... For me, my crafting practices are really about engaging in a larger project of meaning making mm -hmm. um, and really about connecting to the environment. And um, that is what his book is all about. He's kind of asking, like with these traditional crafts that we used to engage in, what did that say? What did that tell us about how we think, how we experience the world, how we connect with other people and with the environment um, and kind of what might we be losing if we're no longer engaging in those kind of things. Um, plus, I just really admire, um, because I see something of myself in him, like, he's a real extremist. Mm -hmm. So, like, he doesn't want to just, like, read about thatching a roof. He wants to, like, thatch a thatch roof. A roof. <laughs> yeah. And so, I, can, I have that edge to my personality, too. I try not to get obsessive 
uh, when I can avoid it. But but even this life journey you're taking of you know possibly in one year to ninety. 90 minutes? I just went from, <laughs> I knew what you meant though. I just went from an hour to 90 minutes. Like I, my brain just like switched from months to time. It's Is the it, heat. Do you, do you know? It's, it's the, the heat. heat. Um, <laughs> one year to 18 months is yeah. what I meant to say. That's an extreme choice. To oh, become yeah. a lifer mm -hmm. in a monastery. Mm -hmm. So I totally get that yeah, about your personality. it really is. Did you get yeah. new glasses? And stuff? I did, yeah. yeah. Now forgive me for being redundant, but no, when all. you started knitting, were you knitting with wool? Or mm -hmm. you were. So, do you think that at the beginning you you got that whole connection of an animal provided this for me? Like, did you get that? At the yeah, start? I did get that. Um, I don't think I got it to the degree that I get it now, where mm -hmm. I know the difference between merino and Shetland, and you know all the different kind of breeds of of wool. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely got that this is a product that comes from the natural environment. Um, plus I just, I mean, I think there's something, um, almost intuitive about it. Like I think it's not that knitting or crafting with acrylic is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that people know when they handle something that's made from a natural fiber, mm. they really just know the difference in the body. Mm. Um, yeah, that's so. interesting because I do think you're right. I think if you start to crochet or fiber or knit, <laughs> crochet. <laughs> Words are so hard. Crochet or knit with acrylic, let's say. Uh -huh. You still have a sense that you're hand making something, right? Oh yeah. If, yeah. if only mm -hmm. for the fact that it's straining mm -hmm. your brain, maybe perhaps because mm -hmm. it's new. Mm -hmm. um, it's taking a long time. Yeah. Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I, I, it really took me a long time to process that I'm wearing something that has a bigger story, mm -hmm. like even mm -hmm. cotton. Right? Oh yeah. Did yeah. I ever think about a plant when I put on cotton as a kid? No, I did mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't either. But you can imagine a child who grew up on a farm mm -hmm. or in another period of time, mm -hmm. most likely not a rich child, mm -hmm. because I think mm -hmm. the well-off probably didn't process this either, mm -hmm. right? That this silk, this piece of silk that mm -hmm. was made into your little suit came from worms. No, Do I you don't, know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I don't know that they processed that, but I think they did have a sense of the craft, mm. kind of the know-how, the knowledge, and the expertise that went into garments in particular. I mean, really into anything, but like... it had to get made. It had to get made. And you had to be measured. Yeah. You that couldn't just true. go out to the store and buy your dress. Yeah, there was you not know, ready to wear. To, yeah. <laughs> there was no Calvin Klein. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that from Downton Abbey, that, yeah. that uh -huh. there was a scene... I guess that would have been the late, like, I think that the show starts maybe in 19, I think 1900 had already passed, because mm -hmm. it goes into the 20s, Yeah, I think. it's in the early, early 20th century. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I remember the sisters were fighting about who got to get a new dress, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they had to go get fitted, and maybe yeah. the budget was only for one mm -hmm. dress a season or something. Mm -hmm. So I guess you're right, They the more well-off would have had a sense of that. Mm -hmm. But I do think there is something missing with the whole, let's plant the seeds. Yeah, and that's then absolutely harvest right. it and yes. whatever yeah. else. Yeah. Okay, so um, a few quotes. I already shared some of my favorite quotes on one of our book clubs, but um, this just, I just got to this part today where, so one of the things I love about learning and reading and stuff is mm -hmm. when you figure out where something you might say all the time comes from. Oh yeah, I love that. Yeah. Or like a compound word mm -hmm. that I had never uh, split apart mm -hmm. before and realized, mm -hmm. oh, it's this and this. I can't mm -hmm. think of an example right now. But this, this phrase, been through the mill. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes, yeah. yeah. I had never thought of that before. <laughs> and even I've done probably three different mill tours where uh -huh. I've shown people Here's the animal, here's the washing, uh -huh. here's the carding, here's the uh -huh. this. I've never made the connection uh -huh. of that phrase. Uh -huh. Did Did you have any aha moments like that while you read the book that you can remember? I know oh my gosh. it's hard if you're not reading it right now. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, in terms of language, the big aha moment for me was he has this really beautiful description of why he picks this word, craft, mm. um, as the title for the book and why that's kind of the concept that he's exploring. Mm -hmm. Because he traces the word craft back to this craft. So we think of craft as 
creating something. Mm -hmm. um, and we think of it more in terms of the finished object. But he says it originally had this meaning more of the knowledge and the wisdom cumulatively over generations for how you even got from the sheep to the sweater mm. or whatever, or from the grass that the sheep eats to the sweater. Um, Almost intangible? Yeah, yeah, an intangible kind of know-how. Mm -hmm. And I'd never, I never knew that about the word craft. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess if he put into words what I had only kind of intuited before, mm. that my having these two needles and like a pattern that I follow to make a sweater and the yarn, all of that comes from really thousands of years of experimentation and breeding and expertise that people have had. Like somebody figured out that like a knit on one row and a pearl on the next row makes for a seed stitch, mm -hmm. you know? Somebody figured out that if you had a string that attached your needles, then you could knit in the round. You know, people discovered those techniques mm -hmm. and that's passed on to me. So there's this whole history behind it. Um, and then with that same word, like I loved it that he went into this whole description of crafty. Yes, I loved that. Yeah, wasn't that cool? That's at the very beginning. Yeah, the very beginning. How it's almost like a negative. Yeah. Like, mm, you're being so yeah. crafty, like clever, like, like negative clever. Yes, exactly. Like a witch. Like, yeah. He talked about a witchcraft. Yeah, I think he did, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that actually crafty is somebody who has learned to operate outside of the system, mm -hmm. but get their own needs met. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what so many of us do in the fiber arts world is whether it's the color that you want or the pattern or the materials or the environmental impact or the fit or whatever it is that kind of in mainstream fast fashion doesn't work for you, you can make your custom, you know, garment or accessory or whatever. Um, by being crafty. By being crafty. Yeah. Someone was commenting, I don't know if it was on my book club video or something else, but she said she was new to the industry, or sorry, new to knitting. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that she noticed is that what we've logged as far as what's popular or trendy or whatever in knitting is only about 15 to 20 years. She, only ha she feels mm -hmm. like she can only see it 10 to 20 years mm -hmm. because of Ravelry or... Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm some magazines that we can still get our hands on maybe from the 80s or 70s mm -hmm. and so she said there's just this whole gap there's all of this information that's missing and that's why archaeologists mm -hmm. are a thing mm -hmm. and oh I know what episode it was on it was on this episode I had for the uh, Center for Crochet and I'm mm -hmm. getting it wrong I'm gonna write it right here Center for Knit and Crochet <laughs> so she's she's trying to gather all of the sources of textiles in all mm -hmm. of the museums in one mm -hmm. place, like a database, mm -hmm. and then you can enter them also. Oh. So, for example, I have a, a bonnet that uh -huh. I'm told my, gram my great grandmother wore. Uh -huh. So she was born in 1900. Mm -hmm. So all I can say about it is I think it's wool, mm -hmm. I don't know why it wouldn't be, and I can tell it's crochet, mm -hmm. and 1900, that's when she was born, so I'm assuming who made it for her, I don't know, maybe right. probably her mother, right. maybe her grandma, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know anything about it, and mm -hmm. she's only two generations or yeah. three away, yeah. but I still have the piece, and then mm -hmm. I also have an Afghan that that baby later mm -hmm. crocheted herself, mm -hmm. and so that's all I've got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, I can see why he's so interested in it. Mm -hmm. In this chapter, he's talking about this, um, this farm, I must farm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I feel like it almost sounds like they found uh, a mill or like a, that was, that had sunk into the ground yeah. and was thus preserved. Yeah. Wouldn't that be so cool to find? That would be so cool. Never mind find. the dinosaur bones. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Who cares about them? Just, <laughs> if you had been, if you could dust out a uh -huh. mill. Uh huh. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fascinating? It would be fascinating. And I think part of, part of what I'm connecting with and what you're saying is, like, for generations, our families, particularly in the fiber arts, were engaged in, and particularly the women, were engaged in making clothing and quilts and things like that, that had a history, and everyone would have known the history. Mm -hmm. And then, for many of us, not for everybody, it was, certainly it's true in my family, like, with my mother's mother, suddenly the women stopped crafting. Yeah. 
because so, it was a necessity. Right. And then it was so exciting right. that they could just buy it at the department exactly. store. Exactly. I totally get that, mm -hmm. why they stopped doing it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. And now we're back to, but wait. Right, we want to do it because it's fun, yeah. you know, we want to do it because it connects us to other people yeah. and, you know, for a whole host of reasons, but, but it does mean that, you know, like my mom has her uh, mother's quilt that I guess was probably made for my grandparents when they got married mm -hmm. or something, um, but she doesn't know anything about it. Yeah. So she just has this object that obviously has a history, but who knows what the history mm -hmm. is. So there's a there's a gap there's there, a gap. and it can't really be bridged mm -hmm. for many of us. I think you're right. You know? I think because my grandma, who was ninety, probably ninety three, mm -hmm. she w she was raising kids in the fifties, so mm -hmm. of course she wanted to buy it at the department yeah. store. Like that yeah. was chic and and mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there's just a couple quotes I, I want to just read oh, yeah, and see please, what you have to say. Please. So one that, so there's a whole chapter on beekeeping, which mm -hmm. is kind of fascinating. Even oh, I if, loved that chapter. Yeah, yeah, I'm right now battling Japanese beetles and uh -huh. mm -hmm. just watching their patterns and just, it's all about mating with Japanese beetles, apparently. <laughs> um, That's where you get the pheromone traps. I just did. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I think we're at the height of the season because just putting it together, I was like, ah! Like, the second one I put up, I was like, stay in the house, and then run to the tree. Like, it was crazy. Ah! But um, it was a really fascinating chapter, and the very last quote, last line of the chapter, which I love, is this. The craft in beekeeping is not in the meddling in the bees' affairs, mm -hmm. but in the preparation of their home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk about that, and it, you can apply it to knitting or not, but what do you think mm -hmm. of that? Mm -hmm. So, not in the meddling in the bees' affairs, but in the preparation of their home. Mm -hmm. what, what was the takeaway? Did you have a takeaway from that? About that quote? Yeah, that quote. You know, I hadn't remembered that quote mm -hmm. until until you pointed it out. I mean, I loved the chapter because he, I, we keep bees here, we and we don't have any here at the moment because we lost our colonies over the winter. Because do they die or they leave? Well, they died, okay. yeah. We think because of the cold. Mm -hmm. um, but so, in traditional beekeeping, you, well, today's version of traditional beekeeping, you have these boxes that have um, wooden slats in them, and the bees build their home, sort of, they build the comb and all that on the, onto the slats, and you take the lid off, and you're supposed to inspect them, and, and the idea is that you're checking for disease, mm -hmm. you're getting rid of any parasites that might be in there, but most beekeepers are also killing queen cells, to make sure that the hive doesn't swarm, which is when it splits off and half of it leaves. Right. Um, which they, he talks about. In right. Chapter. So when he's saying that the point in traditional beekeeping is not to meddle in their affairs, that's what he's talking mm -hmm, about, mm -hmm. not to be kind of in their business, mm -hmm. um, because maybe the bees know more about being bees than we do. Right. Um, and so, um, but it's to create a space that they can do their thing mm -hmm. in. Um, and then in that form of beekeeping, because there's no way to get into the hive, you would actually just have to destroy the hive mm -hmm. to get the honey from it. Mm -hmm. um, but he's saying that the destruction of a hive is a part of the natural cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so my whole takeaway from that chapter and connecting it to that quotation is that um, the natural world like really creates its own rhythms and its own ways of being. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we humans, um, to really the detriment of the natural world, have inserted ourselves into those processes when the whole kind of crafty thing that he's talking about is not to insert yourself and destroy the natural process, but how to learn to work with the natural process so mm -hmm. that you're in harmony with the natural world. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not like totally like leave the bees alone, do your own thing. They can find their like, you know, hollow in a tree or whatever, but it's not to destroy or change their natural rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I don't know exactly what the connection to knitting would yeah, be with that, isn't. but, um, but you know, to a certain extent there is, um, I mean, I'm just thinking like breed specific wool oh, yeah. is becoming such a like 
a larger and larger share of the yarn market mm -hmm. um, and more and more people are getting interested in the specific qualities of certain breeds and how they take dye and how they yeah. spin up and all of that kind of thing um, and so I wonder you know you have some like very in larger brands really get a lot of kind of homogenized yarn where mm -hmm. you're getting all these different breeds mixed together to produce this yarn that is wool but it still kind of almost has like a, a kind of bland character yeah like a generic it. quality yeah, a generic quality mm -hmm. and that can be good for some projects yeah um but i think more and more to discover like the richness of our of our um particularly with sheep like the richness of our heritage mm -hmm. um and i think in britain there are what like something like 90 or 100 different probably you know breeds of sheep heritage breeds there um i don't know how many in in the states or in various other parts of the world but um you know i just it makes me wonder like what would it be like if we were more in touch with those specifics mm -hmm. um i think the um the interesting takeaway i had just to just mm -hmm. in general reading this book was how did they keep the sheep alive? Like, we still yeah. have the sheep, and mm -hmm. we have tons of sheep, and mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, they're so, the, the women that I have met who are the farmers, they know so much, and mm -hmm. they've dealt with death, and, mm -hmm. or disease, mm -hmm. and it's so impressive to me oh, yeah. that mm -hmm. we still even have all of these mm -hmm. breeds of sheep. Mm -hmm. And it's so, the person who wants to preserve that heritage breed is so special. Yeah. Um, and I know that more Americans would like to, bring over, and, and do sometimes bring mm -hmm. over special concoctions of certain breeds <laughs> to help with their husbandry. Um, but, uh, you know, some of it's mm -hmm. like not permitted now, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. preparation of the home that they're trying to do, mm -hmm. they've had some red, oh, red yeah. tape with that. Yeah. The way I think about this quote is so different from you, so I'm glad good, I asked. Good. I think about um, motherhood, like uh -huh. being a mom. I, well, I thought about that too, but I was like, Christy's probably gonna. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking. I mean, I, I, of course, I meddle in my children's affairs, yeah. ish. Mm -hmm. But I also, my parenting philosophy is sort of the anti-helicopter mom, mm -hmm. and I'm more like the kick them to the curb mom. Mm -hmm. Like, just go do it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I check their, fo you know, we do phone checks, and mm -hmm. and I'm I'm interested in their lives, but I don't think that I'm um, like a busybody or want to mm -hmm. get my mm -hmm. get all in there. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple times when I'm like. Ooh, I think this is that moment when you kind of have to get in there, mm -hmm. like you know, advocate for your child at school for mm -hmm. maybe something going on that they can't, you know, some sometimes mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. in general, I think that preparing the home is is the best thing because mm -hmm. they come home and they can they can go through all of it there. They feel safe mm -hmm. enough to be their mm -hmm. best, to be their worst. Yep. Yeah. And then in my case, I model the the knitting, and then mm -hmm. sometimes they pick it up and sometimes they don't. And I do think they pick it up? They do. Oh, that's And I think great. that's great. And yeah. mm -hmm. um, I do this thing in my um, family called, well, my last name's Glass, so we do the Glass Guild Awards, which mm -hmm. is at the end of the school year, everyone gets an award for something they did well, mm -hmm. and then usually they get a prize, and it's usually books, mm -hmm. because their summer earnings is if you read, you get paid. I pay you to read. That's great. I think that's great, too. Yeah. And if you finish a knitting project, you also get paid. So, <laughs> um, but anyway. Um, and if it's a sweater for mom, even more. Bonus pay. <laughs> but anyway, I heard, I went in the room to work on them this year, this past year, and I heard my six-year-old say, let's give mom a Glass Guild Award. I heard her say that, and, and she goes, I know, I know. She's really good at knitting. You know, that's what she said, and <laughs> they made me a award It was so sweet. Um, that's very sweet. Uh, anyway, so this, I, I wrote this down. You mentioned it already, that uh -huh. the the colony becomes two. Uh -huh. you, you talked about how mm -hmm. that, I wrote down that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Oh, no, I was just going to say it's really, really amazing because yeah, half of work? what happens is the the colony creates a new queen and yeah. so the old queen and half of the worker bees leave the hive so you get like 10,000 bees that leave yeah. and then the new queen and the other half stay um and so what usually happens is that the the swarm the bees that have left will land on a tree limb or something mm -hmm. in this big ball of bees um, and they send out these bees like all over the place to try to find a suitable home and then they come back and they report back when they have found a suitable home 
when enough of them have reported back the same location, yeah. then the swarm takes off it's, and settles there. I can't. Yeah, it's so cool. And what about the queen? Because isn't that a specific mm. bigger insect? It's a specific bigger bee. And yeah. so how does one be born? How does the queen they get They feed the queen get a born. special, <laughs> yeah. They feed the queen, they feed the, the egg a special um, mixture called royal jelly. And so that's what turns, turns her into a queen. I can't. Yeah. I can't. Okay. And we actually caught a swarm here. So I like I held you... a box with like 10,000 bees in it in my arms. It was the coolest thing. How did you catch it? Well, it landed on a small tree and they're not um, aggressive when they're in a swarm mm -hmm. because they don't have any honey to defend. Yeah. So we just took the a big plastic like rub rubber made box and put it underneath the tree and hit the limb and the whole clump just fell down into the box and then we put them in a new a new set of uh, uh, of boxes, supers and that kind of thing. Okay, but wait a second. You were, were did was someone like on 24 hour lookout for a swarm? No, we just happened to see it when it left. Yeah, we were lucky. Yeah. How does, how long does it stay on the branch? Um, for a few hours. And probably. whose idea was yeah. it to hit the branch and catch it? That was Bernard. He was our our head beekeeper. And he knows that this is, must be a thing. Is oh yeah. Like oh yeah. yeah. On YouTube? <laughs> no, no, he's part of a beekeeping association. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I love this story. Okay, so in the chapter Weft and Warp, um, mm -hmm. I mentioned been through the mill mm -hmm. and. Uh, I just like that because it made me, I'm going to use that phrase more, oh, I've mm -hmm. been through the mill. But like we only say it as like a... You've been we've, carted and calm. Yeah, like we've been through a lot. <laughs> so I think that that makes me appreciate wool more thinking, yeah, that wool has been through the mill. Well, but also, you know, just to like turn it into a, a life metaphor, yeah. if you think about it, like... The wool itself is not useful until it has been through the mill. Been through the mill. And so it's those experiences okay. that feel like that for us that are actually make us into something that's stronger, that's useful, yeah. that's, you know, like all of our character comes from those experiences. Yes. I'm know. thinking of the phrase diamond in the rough. Also. Right, right. So what I thought was interesting is, do you recall the, the portion when he said... It takes a lot of water to clean the wool. Mm -hmm. So uh, he goes and he actually cleans the sheep in mm -hmm. the river or something mm -hmm. before he shears them. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that chapter? I know, I'm not remembering okay, that. Okay, let me see if... Oh, he said, I did this once back in my 20s. It was a glorious experience. On the edge of the farm mm -hmm. was a small stream which turned a sharp corner at the bottom of the meadow and had on its inner bend the perfect beach to launch the unsuspecting flock from. It also had a natural <laughs> depth on its outer bend to submerge them in. I'm convinced after the initial shock of the cold water that the sheep enjoyed the experience as much as I did, they went almost entirely limp as I took them to a depth. <laughs> can you picture this? I can picture it, Where they it, yeah. could just about touch the stream bed. Being relatively buoyant, they required only a supporting <laughs> hand under the muzzle as the other hand worked its way around the body, ruffling, ruffling and combing. A dense cloud of fine dust flowed out of their mm -hmm. bodies. Can you p picture mm -hmm. that under the water? Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I continued with each ewe until the fleeces ran clean. Hauling them out was no mean feat, and they staggered off under the weight of their saturated mm -hmm. fleeces into the plush matter mm -hmm. to, get, to graze and dry. Once sheared, further washing can be undertaken to condition the fleece. Mm -hmm. This was traditionally done by soaking it in lye. And then he talked about, um, oh, I think I should have read this part first. More to the point, the fleece dries a damn sight quicker when it's being carried around on the body of a ewe mm -hmm. grazing in the early summer sun. Mm -hmm. So I wrote down, mm -hmm. less waste if cleaned first. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's less waste of water mm -hmm. if it's cleaned first. Well, I think people who are working with the animals in their natural environment, I mean, and you think about this, like, somebody maybe built that sheep pen, like, right next to that bend in the river because yeah. they knew that that was going to be the best place to clean yeah. the sheep. Dunk them first, you know? let them dry, yeah. then shear them. Absolutely. You know? I, I mean, never we, thought of that yeah. as a step. Yeah. I liked that. Yeah, I think it, I mean, that's part of what he gets at in the book is that when we're working with the natural cycles mm -hmm. of the earth and how, you know, certain things grow and, and how water flows and all of that kind of thing, then you don't have to create so many steps. Yeah. 
You know, if you've got a river right there, you Just wash the sheep in the river, <laughs> and then you don't have to haul water to yeah. wash the fleece. You know, somewhere else. I really else. like that. So, okay, I wrote. I put that. There's another quote. I don't even know what it says. I'm gonna say it, and we'll talk about it. <laughs> we have grown economically accustomed to not setting aside the finances to dedicate manpower mm -hmm. to a means of organically and entirely sustainably managing the landscape. To say nothing of the environmental benefits mm -hmm. that. I think the reason I underlined that was because we've grown economically accustomed to not setting aside finances. Mm -hmm. But knitting is an expensive hobby. It is. It's a very so expensive hobby. So what do we, how do we reconcile that? Um, well, I think we can reconcile it in various ways. Mm -hmm. um, one way that I reconcile it, particularly because, I mean, you can buy cheap yarn. Of course. You know, so. We can do this economically. Yeah. We can trade, we can go to thrift stores, right. we can unravel yeah. sweaters. Oh, yeah. There's I mean, ways I'm, of doing Yeah, it. absolutely. But if you, if you buy yarn that is um, sort of ecologically sound, mm. um, the way that I, and that's always more expensive, mm -hmm. you know, um, the way that I justify that is by saying I'm actually paying the full cost of this yarn. Mm. Um, so if you're buying yarn that was produced in ways that are harmful to the environment, um, with poor labor practices, in, you know, made overseas in ways that are not safe for the workers, mm. you know, all these kind of things, like, you're going to pay a lot less for that yarn because it cost the American or European or whatever company that made it less to make it, mm -hmm. but the true cost of that yarn mm -hmm. is actually quite high. It just, you're not paying it. Yes, so so when I buy yarn that was where the sheep come from here in America and it's produced on a small farm and spun on an old mill and you know, all of these kind of things, they keep it closer to the land. I'm paying more for it, mm -hmm. but I'm actually paying the true cost, what it really costs to produce that yarn. That's good. Um, so that's just a part of how I justify it. And then there are all kinds of, I think this is some of what he's getting at in this quotation is, economics is not just about the money that I have in my bank, mm -hmm. but it's about how I'm spending my time, it's about um, what I'm doing for the world around me, how I'm connecting to my community, it's about all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, if I'm spending, you know, a hundred dollars on materials for a sweater, mm -hmm. that is going to give me like 80 hours of enjoyment mm -hmm. right there. Yep. And it's going to help me to connect with whoever I'm making the sweater for, with my knitting group, with, you know, all these different communities. Um, so it's not just like as simple as saying, I need a sweater. And so this is actually a really expensive way to do that. Mm -hmm. It's about so much more than that. You know what it's about? It's about craft. It's about craft. <laughs> what do you make of the order of the chapters? So I'm about halfway mm -hmm. through just looking at this. Mm -hmm. But the first one after sort of defining craft, craft mm -hmm. which we already talked about, was making hay. Mm -hmm. Do you think mm -hmm. that was a good first chapter? Um, like topic choice? I do think it was because it's sort of a foundational element mm -hmm. to the farming life yeah. um, because the animals have to eat something yeah. in the winter, yeah. you know, and so hay is really, like if you didn't have hay, yeah. you know, what would you do? And we, I never um, think about that Yeah, I never when think I go about to Shake Shack. Either. Yeah, I never exactly. <laughs> think about the hay that was required uh -huh. for me to have Shake Shack mm -hmm. in February. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I also don't like to think about Shake Shack, like where my burger. I don't like to think about that. Mm -hmm. I think this is the hamburger, mm -hmm. it's nothing else. Mm -hmm. But that is that's just sort of the point, right? That's the that's PETA's mm -hmm. point. That's be people Absolutely. who are vegan. I mean, even yeah. vegans, true vegans, won't even eat honey. Oh, yeah, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we're vegan ish. Are you really? Yes, oh. well, my husband is vegan ish, and so I eat a lot of vegan, uh -huh. and I uh -huh. understand it, and I know how to cook it. Uh -huh. Like, uh -huh. some people are really like, What? What does it mean? What do we do? And mm -hmm. I, I can do that for mm -hmm. you. Um, but so we eat vegan a lot, but uh, I'm not vegan, I'm vegan ish because sometimes <laughs> I want my shake shack. It's always bacon that gets me. And Bacon. Yeah, I mean, I've I've tried vegetarianism, never veganism, but I've tried vegetarianism a few times, mm -hmm. 
and it's always bacon. It's like crack, you know? There's I someone just... who I don't want to embarrass. I won't say who she is, but she's tried to go vegetarian. I think she is on a vegetarian route right now. Mm -hmm. But she said, I'm mm -hmm. vegetarian except for fried chicken. And I'm like, <laughs> the vegetarians don't appreciate you. Yeah. They don't appreciate yeah. you. Um, I, it's getting hot, so we should go. And if this is just meant to be one episode of Book Club, yeah. and I need to keep reading. But any final thoughts on Crest before I sign off? Well... He comes back to this in the end, so it's not a. Sp I don't want to give you a spoiler. No, no spoilers here, um, but he really. I think the big one of the biggest takeaways for me is just the way that he situates all of these crafts within the landscape, mm -hmm. and he comes back at the end to the kitchen table, and he what? says like every. Speaking of Shake Shack. Right. Exactly. He says every single one of these crafts exists. To come back to the kitchen table mm. and it's about how we form community and live in community with one another and with the planet that you know that we call home so so good yeah. and one of the things that we sort of have talked about uh, on this this theme is mm -hmm. we talk about the push of the button and how how can we get out of our phones mm -hmm. but we're having book club on YouTube well right which exactly. is really cool yes. yeah because yeah. you know I've met people and I feel like the Christy Glass Knits channel and I'm sure you feel this mm -hmm. way about yours too is um is building community in a different way it is absolutely and it's a yeah. really cool opportunity yeah. honestly yeah to connect with people who yeah. you don't have to even mm -hmm. just to drive here is 40 minutes it was mm -hmm. awesome but you know mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. connect on instagram yeah. tomorrow yeah too yeah. so i think that is something so special but mm -hmm. i feel a sense of responsibility mm -hmm. to 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 keep maybe not the kitchen table because that's not my favorite <laughs> craft <laughs> of cooking but the idea, as a metaphor, the kitchen table uh -huh. alive with the uh -huh. knitting circle or whatever it is. Absolutely. And I know yeah. you really got, you, you all feel that, that here too at the monastery. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we're all about community mm -hmm. and we get a lot of people who come to us craving community, yeah. like craving in-person mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. because we do have, and it is a real gift of the digital world that we live in that you can connect to people all over the place. Um, so I have people I've grown close to on Instagram who I think of as my friends, mm -hmm. but I've never actually met them yeah. in person, yeah. you know? Um, and yet at the same time, we human beings need that like face-to-face -face connection. Mm -hmm. So it's not about choosing one over the other or saying like digital life is bad, mm -hmm. but it is about saying, you know, there are limits to it and we can't have it sort of on its own. We need it in harmony with other aspects mm -hmm. to life. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing that we're here on YouTube and yeah. people are connecting with us and we're connecting with them. And, yeah. mm -hmm. That's so cool. Well, thank you for taking time out of your <gasps> hot July day. <laughs> thank you. To discuss craft. And until <laughs> next time, we will sign off. Bye. Bye.